Hey everybody out there, it's Stephen and Jesse again here at the Center for Birds of Prey outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, today we're going to talk about vultures, one of our favorite groups of animals to talk about. We're um, about a week into our, uh, our response to the coronavirus and, and doing our minimizing staff um, and all of those things. So uh, it's, it's tough for us because we don't get to talk to you and and uh, do what we really love to do out here which is teach people more about these birds so we're gonna spend a little time today talking about vultures hopefully you'll have questions Jessie's behind the camera she'll do her best to uh, interject with those questions as we go uh, I'm gonna back up and get out of the frame here and um, tell you a little bit about what you're looking at what's happening out here in front of the camera is what we call a vulture restaurant and we'll hit on vulture restaurants in a few different uh, in a few different utilizations, um, but essentially this is a way that we can dispose of food that our birds don't eat. Even though we feed our collection of birds every day, they don't necessarily eat everything. And so we can, uh, rather than dumping that food into a landfill somewhere, we can put it out here in our field at the center for the wild vultures to eat. So we've got uh, a little uh, aggregation of black vultures and turkey vultures, two of our natives here in North America that are feeding, and we'll talk about how to identify those. I'm going to be keeping my eye out on the surroundings as well because we know that vultures aren't the only scavenging birds out there. There are lots of scavengers, and if we're lucky, we might get a look at a few others today as well. So what is a vulture? What's the deal with them anyway? We can start there. Vultures are a group of birds found all over the world uh, that share a few common characteristics. Um, generally they are considered to be what we would call an obligate scavenger, meaning that really the only method they have for acquiring a meal of animal protein is to find an animal that has already died or uh, the remains of an animal that has died. They don't have the killing tools like a hawk or an eagle would in most cases. Uh, there are generally assumed to be uh, between 22 and 23 vulture species in the world depending on uh, whether you include some of the ones that are around the fringes, but uh, here in the New World, in North America and South America, we have seven species of what we would refer to as New World vultures, uh, the cathartid vultures, and then in the Old World, they have the remainder, 15 or 16, 15 or 16, depending on how you do the math of what we call the old world vultures. So these birds out here in front of us, you can see a few things about them, uh, even at a great distance. And that first thing is that they get around really well on the ground. These birds, vultures in general, tend to have long legs and long uh, flat feet, good for moving around the carcass, uh, also good for moving around one another. As a social scavenger like this, they spend a lot of time around each other and uh, as we'll likely see, there, there may be a, a disagreement about which piece of food belongs to which bird and those feet might help you get out of the way of someone who's coming to try to take from you. So um, here in the New World, again, we have three species of vulture, the black vulture and the turkey vulture, or not in the New World, in North America. We have three species. The black vulture and the turkey vulture are the two most common. The turkey vulture is the most widespread. So if I'm looking out here at this group of birds, I see three turkey vultures. The birds both to the farthest left and the farthest right are both turkey vultures, oh, almost now the one on the left is moving in. Two turkey vultures kind of squabbling with one another there off to the left of the screen. Um, a brown bird, a little longer looking than the black vulture. A head that as an adult is, is red. We didn't even get into that yet. These bald heads that we'll see in vultures for the obvious reason of staying clean while they're feeding, but also for communication as we'll talk about in a, a few minutes. The black vulture, all black essentially um, from head to toe. Uh, grays and blacks only um, in the in the plumage when they're standing still. We'll talk about flight appearance in a minute as well. So um, black vulture and turkey vulture, that's two of our three native species here in North America, the two most common. The, the black vulture is limited to the south. Um, one of the things we talk about, uh, do we have questions flowing Not in, yet. Jesse? No questions yet, so we're okay there. Uh, one of the things we talk about quite often here at the center as it pertains to vultures is that even though most of us, when asked how are vultures doing in the world, most North Americans would probably answer, they must be doing just fine, Stephen. I'm, I'm looking at 20 vultures right out, out here in the field in front of me, or 
uh, I, I see vultures all the time in my daily life. They, they must be doing fine all over the world. Well, um, our little microcosm here in South Carolina and in North America is not necessarily a, a good representation of the world as a whole as it pertains to vultures. So uh, more than half of all of the vulture species in the world are considered endangered or critically endangered, meaning that they are at risk of extinction in the near term. Uh, we'll talk about some of the, the consequences of that, but uh, for simplicity's sake, more than half of those 22 species are on the brink of extinction. We're lucky that in North America we have healthy vulture populations to rely on. Um, when we get into their job and, and how they're helping us, well, we'll see that uh, they are incredibly important. So what's going on out there in the world that is causing such uh, declines in vulture species. Well, we know that there are different stories happening in, in most of the, uh, of the old world. Most of Europe and Asia and Africa are seeing similar declines for, for different reasons. If we start in Asia, that's sort of the most well-known of these stories. Some of you may have heard this before, but in India and Pakistan and Nepal, most of Asia over the last 30 years has seen declines of close to 100% in their most common vulture species. So that essentially means that in most of our lifetimes, they've gone from the most common birds out there to essentially extinct. Uh, the cause of that decline was something nobody thought would cause a problem at all. It was actually something that we were introducing to the environment as a medication. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's called diclofenac. Uh, you could do a little bit of Google research while you're here in your homeschool environment and look up diclofenac. You'll see that it's used in human medicine all over the world. It's good for aches and pains, good for um, gout and bursitis, all, all kinds of great uh, pain relief in, in uh, humans um, as well as in some other animals, which is where the problem started. About 30 years ago in India, they started utilizing it on their livestock. So if a cow or a goat got sick, they gave it diclofenac to help it feel better. Uh, cheap, effective drug. Turns out it works really well. Helps the cows to feel better. But uh, then the inevitable happens. Uh, we know that every animal has a beginning of its life and an end of its life. And the problem started when the cows that were treated with diclofenac died. And then uh, we know that vultures will gladly eat those cows. The unfortunate thing is that that drug that was so helpful for the cows, diclofenac, is actually toxic to old world vultures if they eat it. So the vultures of Asia and, and, uh, and Europe and Africa were dying because of uh, ingesting this thing that we thought was a medicine. And it essentially killed all of the vultures in Asia. Now they're dealing with the consequences of, of that problem. We look out here and we can see how great a job vultures are doing scavenging. These birds are built for efficiency in scavenging. They've got all kinds of adaptations. We'll hit on a few of them as we go along. So when they disappear, uh, and, um, and uh, as they have in, in Asia, what's the consequence? Well, a lot of folks, their first response is that if we didn't have any vultures to eat the dead stuff, then the dead stuff would just pile up. We'd just have carcasses everywhere. Um, while that sounds like a logical answer, it doesn't take into account the fact that just about every carnivore out there, including you and me, I'm surprised we haven't seen any others yet, but everybody out there that's a carnivore will scavenge given the opportunity. It appears there must have been a good piece that one of these black vultures has grabbed and everybody else wants it. Uh, a little comical uh, to watch them as they compete over that. But um, the reality is that vultures are by far uh, not the only scavenger out there. Everybody wants to eat dead things. And so what we saw happen in Asia uh, and what we're likely to see happen in other parts of the world is that when the vultures disappear, other animals take their place. Other animals that can reproduce more quickly that may not be affected in the same way by uh, diclofenac poisoning. Uh, in India, it was primarily feral dogs and rats. And so now they have lots of dogs and rats that consume the majority of the carrion there. And, um, and so there's no problem with piling carcasses. The problem results from the diseases that those other scavengers carry. So we're in a time where we're talking a lot about uh, viruses and bacteria and things that animals pass from one to another. One of the great things about birds is uh, first there aren't a lot of diseases that um, they would pass from a human or from a bird to a human. And when we look at vultures, their amazing digestive system is actually one of the most powerful uh, tools on the planet for getting viruses and bacteria out of the system. So uh, their stomach acid is in the neighborhood of pH 1. So uh, do your chemistry lesson later on and look at 
acids and bases and a pH of one is a, a strong acid, a very strong. It's perhaps a hundred times stronger than the acid in our stomachs. So uh, bacteria like the bacteria that cause botulism or anthrax, they're killed by the digestive system of these birds. Uh, they're not, however, killed by the digestive systems of rats and dogs. And rats and dogs also spread diseases that can uh, cross from uh, those animals to uh, mammals like humans. Uh, the biggest disease of, of note in Asia right now is rabies. They have one of the highest incidents or perhaps the highest incidence of rabies anywhere in the world in India uh, right now, primarily because they don't have vultures to keep the dog populations in check. And so uh, scavengers are incredibly important to us. These are birds that we want to understand and protect uh, and do our best by them they're also really amazing. We'll meet one up close here in a couple minutes and we can uh, see how beautiful they are and talk about how intelligent they are and, and the like. I just rambled for a while. Did any questions pop up in there, Jesse? What is the substance they wipe on their heads and feet to protect them from disease? So what is the substance that they wipe on their heads and their feet to protect them from disease? So technically no substance anywhere being wiped on anything to protect them from diseases. There's no, uh, there's no uh, hand sanitizer for vultures, but there are some cool things. So first of all, the, the bald head is a way to keep yourself from getting too soiled. Uh, if you had beautiful feathers on your face and you were feeding on carrion like this, you would likely get buildup of bacteria in those feathers. It's a hard place to clean as well. So lacking plumage on the face is one way to stay clean. Uh, they also spend a lot of time grooming their face with their feet. Uh, they bathe quite a bit as well. So uh, in terms of keeping bacteria down there, that's one thing that they do. Lots of bathing as well. Um, one other kind of interesting adaptation that may have some antimicrobial impacts for them relates to their feet and their legs. We'll look at a bird up close in a minute and we'll be able to see this. But uh, vultures here in the New World, so the North American and South American vultures, turkey vultures, black vultures, the condors, uh, they have a behavior called urohydrosis, where they actually urinate on their legs and their feet. Kind of a strange thing when you think about it. But a behavior that has some positive impacts on the bird. The first and most well accepted of the functions of that adaptation is that when they urinate on their feet, it provides an opportunity for evaporative cooling. Birds can't sweat. They're endothermic like you and me. They maintain their body, their own body temperature and in hot weather, they need to cool down. So how do I cool down if I can't sweat and it's hot out? Well, if I urinate on my legs, uh, the water can evaporate off of my skin and, and take heat just like sweat would off of my skin. Uh, what it leaves behind, and, and we can't really see it on these birds at such a distance, what it leaves behind is a, a weak acid, not nearly as strong as that pH 1 that's happening in their stomach, but a weak acid in the form of what's called uric acid. That's the compound that vultures and birds in general utilize to get nitrogen out of their system. It's kind of whitish in color. Uh, maybe one day we'll do a program on bird poop and we'll look at it and you can see the white part of bird poop. That's uric acid. So vultures end up with that uric acid on their legs, which may, who knows, may uh, minimize the amount of bacteria that are able to colonize on their feet when they're walking around a carcass and out there doing what they do. So um, kind, of, kind of interesting. One of our good friends here at the center, Dr. Paul Nolan, he's over at the Citadel. I doubt he's watching today, but uh, he's probably watching a penguin video if he's watching anything. Uh, he's a, a great lover of the vulture as well, and he's had some fun with his students over the years looking at the antimicrobial impacts of that weak uric acid on their feet. And there's still jury's still out on on that in terms of how effective it is. Are there more questions or I'm just blabbing about vultures now? Everybody having fun? Is that vulture nesting on the ground again this year? So um, that's a great question. We have for the last two seasons had a pair of black vultures that have nested here at our center. Uh, and we had them on webcam. And up until about a week ago, they were nesting again, just like they had in years past. We tried to discourage them in a variety of ways, but they, uh, simply because it caused a lot of disruption for us, along with the benefit of being able to watch them. Uh, they did nest again this year in the same spot laid two eggs just as they did in years past but for whatever reason um, they abandoned the attempt so whether the eggs were infertile or whether uh, there was something else happening we're not certain but they have abandoned it I'm not uh, certain that one of these birds that you're looking at out here in front of you may be one of the birds from that pair uh, 
Uh, obviously, we do see a lot of birds hanging around. So I didn't talk about vulture restaurants, and let me do that really quickly. When I first heard of vulture restaurants, it was related to Asia, to the vulture crisis happening in India. And one of the ways that they are working there to ensure that birds don't continue to die from diclofenac poisoning, um, which I talked about a little earlier, uh, is by providing them safe food. So even though they've banned the use of diclofenac in veterinary medicine, they did that a long time ago, there's no guarantee that people won't still utilize it out there and so providing safe places for vultures to feed is really important um, to do and so vulture restaurants were an idea that if we put a safe carcass in the same place day after day after day by safe i mean a carcass that doesn't have that medication in it we can ensure that any vultures that are left out there are less likely to eat contaminated food and that's a, a great way to, um, to protect those birds. So um, that started in Asia. Well, we don't have a similar crisis happening here in North America, at least not yet. Um, diclofenac doesn't look like it causes problems for our vultures, um, even if we were using it, which to my knowledge, uh, we don't utilize it in veterinary medicine here. But we have other issues that vultures face. Car collision is one of them. And uh, we know that vultures get hit by cars all the time. In fact, this morning, I was inches away from a collision with a turkey vulture on Highway 17 on my way to work. I had to slam on the brakes uh, and, and I almost collided with a bird. It was flying off of something that was in the median. I didn't see what it was. Um, couldn't have been very big because there were only one or two vultures around, but a carcass of some kind. The idea is that if we can move those carcasses to safer places, it doesn't have to be to any specific place like uh, this field in front of you here, it can just be away from the lanes of traffic. If we can move those carcasses away from the dangerous place, well, maybe then the vultures and the eagles won't have to worry about car collision. So one thing we utilize uh, this vulture restaurant for here at the center is to work to get roadkill off of the highway. Now we're not asking you to bring that roadkill to us. We can't manage it, and nor do we want to bring all of the roadkill from all of the world to one tiny corner of Allendahl. Uh, we work uh, on our own to bring carcasses from close to our center campus. And then we work with Mount Pleasant uh, Animal Control and Charleston County's Animal Control when they have time uh, to bring carcasses from our locality here to this location, they do that. Uh, my suggestion would be uh, maybe talk to your community planners about ways that you could uh, work in your own community to get those carcasses to a safe place for the vultures to eat them. Overall, how are turkey vultures and black vultures doing in the U.S.? So overall, how are turkey vultures and black vultures doing here in the U.S.? And so maybe if we expanded one more and said, because I said we have three vulture species here in the United States, turkey vulture and black vulture, the two common ones. Uh, does anybody know the third of the species of vultures? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to, to chime it in. Who's the third vulture species native to North America? Katie Malakar, if you're out there, you Crickets. might not be playing. What's that? Crickets, there's crickets, no one's answering. The third vulture, it's one of the largest birds on the planet. It's so vulture cool that we don't even call it a vulture. Did somebody Madison get Madison Yost, California condor. Madison Yost, got it. It's the California condor, which by the way, is a critically endangered species. So we have two species of vultures in North America, the black vulture and the turkey vulture, which as the scene in front of us here would indicate um, are doing quite well. In fact, black vulture populations might be expanding. Historically, they've been a bird that have been limited to their range primarily due to uh, weather and, and landscape. They're a more warm weather dependent bird. They're a little heavier and so maybe they need more hot air in order to effectively move. So they've been a Southern North American and South American species. But they're moving north up into uh, Kentucky and uh, even some sightings in New York State and Pennsylvania over time. And the turkey vulture, uh, a quite healthy species in general. So uh, does that mean no problems for them? Absolutely not. It, it most certainly doesn't mean that we just rest on the fact that today vultures are healthy because that's exactly the scenario they would have seen 30 years ago in Asia. Vultures were healthy and today they're gone. 30 years is not that long of a period of time. So what might we need to be paying attention to in terms of vultures out there? While they take off and fly away, um, maybe I'll take a pause from the what we need to pay attention to and I'll come back. Uh, well, maybe not because they're already flown away. Let's talk about what we need to pay attention to. Um, one issue we think everyone needs to be aware of in terms of vulture conservation here in North America is the fact that uh, we think many, if not most, of these vultures and vultures around our continent are suffering from the effects of lead. 
Lead is an element that is present here on our planet. We use it for lots of things. It makes great, um, great uh, help for lots of, of things that we build here in our world. Um, but we know that if we ingest it, if an animal ingests lead, it can cause problems for them. It causes neurological damage. It can ultimately cause death. It's really bad for you if you eat it. And it's one of the reasons that we don't use lead in paint uh, today here in the United States. And we stopped utilizing it in gasoline for the most part so that we weren't ingesting it. Human beings weren't. And it wasn't causing those problems for us. Um, but we know that of the vultures we test in our medical clinic, so these are birds that come into us uh, after running into problems out there, we test all of them, all the vultures and the bald eagles for that matter, about 70 to 80% of them test positive for elevated levels of lead. So even though we're not using it in gas anymore, and we're not using it in paint anymore, and uh, these birds don't drink water out of pipes uh, that might be made out of lead, somehow they're still ending up with high levels of lead in their system. And we think that two of the big causes of that are lead that we might utilize in some of our um, in some of our recreation or leisure pursuits. So two that I'm talking about here uh, are hunting and fishing. So I'm a South Carolinian, grew up on James Island, grew up in the woods with a gun and on the water with a fishing line. I love to hunt and fish. It's something that I get to choose to do as an American, one of our, uh, one of our great privileges here in the United States, like many of you might as well, right? But I don't like the idea that something I'm doing uh, might cause problems for a group of animals that I know are really important and that, um, that I know I want to protect. So it really leads me to think about ways I might do differently. So how do hunting and fishing cause problems? Well, the bullets that uh, you might use in a gun uh, or the fishing tackle that you might use when you're fishing, a lot of them are made from lead. It's just a uh, that's the way it is. We've always made those things out of lead. Lead's heavy. Lead's, lead is very dense. It's really soft. It works great as a bullet for hunting things. It also works great as a weight to sink things, but there are alternatives. And so um, what I'm hoping this might do is open us up to have a discussion. Uh, if we stop utilizing lead in bullets and fishing tackle, we're going to be doing better by these birds. If we start looking for alternatives to those things, um, other metal alloys, other substances out there that might work great for bullets and fishing tackle. Well, ultimately, we're going to protect our own health in the long run because we're going to do better by these scavengers. So we can talk a little bit about vulture ID, then we probably need to get a vulture out. We're going really long on this. Uh, everybody's still having fun out there, learning something, maybe. Um, that would be great. So uh, I've got some wings here. Probably a good point to mention that we treat injured birds here at the Center for Birds of Prey. Still happening today. Birds are being admitted to our hospital. They're receiving care. The procedures there are a little bit different in this new, uh, in this new world we're operating in. Uh, transporters aren't are being asked to stay out of the building so that we don't transmit anything um, human to human because we know that's where our problem is today. But birds are still coming in being treated. Unfortunately, many of the birds that come into our hospital die. Either they die as a result of their injuries or they die um, after having to be euthanized because their injuries are such we can't fix them. It does allow us an opportunity to utilize what we call bio artifacts to, to help teach a little bit more about these birds so you can understand them. So as they're moving out here in front, that's a turkey vulture in flight, two turkey vultures in flight. Uh, we'll start with turkey vulture. Um, they are most easy to identify by their general profile. So when they glide or soar, they hold their wings in a dihedral. It's like a V from side to side. And they kind of gently rock back and forth like this. It's easy to see. And uh, there's a few of them doing it quite nicely out here in front of us. Uh, again, brown in color uh, for the most part. But if you catch a nice look at the underside of their wing, you'll see a pattern that emerges often uh, even at a distance when you're viewing them. And that is what we call a silvery trailing edge. So the trailing edge, the edge closest to the back of the bird of the underside of their wing tends to look sort of silverish gray as they're flying all the way from the body out to the tips of the wings, a uniform silverish gray. Um, they again rocking, but silvery gray trailing edge. The black vulture, on the other hand, in comparison, a little bit shorter wing, interestingly, heavier body, shorter wing, doesn't um, necessarily make sense, but it's one of those reasons that um, black vultures we think are limited to more southern latitudes, is they're a little heavier in body. But instead of having the entire trailing edge of the wing, that silvery white color, it's basically just the tip of the wing that has that silvery white uh, coloration. So, um, 
a way to identify them. Often they look like they're wearing white gloves on their wings. They tend to have more panicky flapping wing beats as well. So uh, turkey vultures are pretty easy to identify uh, in the air and on the ground. Both large dark colored birds. So go outside for your, um, for your mommy mandated recess today if you can. Get out uh, even though the weather's not super great here today. Uh, we want to get outside as long as we're keeping our safe distance from uh, other humans and look around chances are you'll see a vulture big dark colored birds um, all around north america this time of year some of the turkey vultures are returning from um, wintering grounds many of them migrate um, some even go all the way to south america okay are there questions that popped up during that no so let's get out of vulture and we can maybe talk about one up close for a few minutes and then we'll wrap it up I did read something before we get this bird out. I read something exciting. One of my favorite vulture species of all of them, uh, a vulture called the bearded vulture, uh, one found in the old world. It's one of the largest of the vultures. They used to go by a different name. They were once called the Lammergeier. Uh, but if you search bearded vulture, um, when you've got a minute out there, really gorgeous bird, but one that has experienced declines in lots of places. Their old name, Lammergeier, actually meant lamb killer. So you can imagine that even though the, uh, the bearded vultures don't kill lambs at all, uh, they might have had kind of a, a rough reputation. People looked at them as big, scary things. They're pretty awesome looking too. They've got uh, beautiful coloration on them, all kinds of cool stuff about the Lammergeier. But uh, I was reading about uh, in Spain, I believe it was in Spain, Cote de Europe, uh, the, the peaks of Europe. Anyway, um, the first Lammergeier chick to hatch in the wild since that species was declared extinct in that region in the 1950s has hatched. It was an announcement that was made today. That's a success story. So how does that work if it went extinct in an area? Well, the Lammergeier, or the bearded vulture, pushed to extinction. Um, and so how do we fix that? Well, they started a captive breeding and release program uh, back about a decade or so ago, back in the mid 2000s. And um, those birds that were released into the wild have set up pairs. This particular pair formed in 2014 and today in 2020 have hatched their first wild chick. So it was extinct and now they are breeding again in a region. It goes to show that we can fix the problems. Uh, arguably though, we really want to work hard to be on the forefront of these problems so that we don't end up scrambling to respond, wasting time that we might have been spending better. Uh, these lessons can be taken broadly in terms of all kinds of um, problems that we might encounter in terms of nature or human health or animal health that we want to be alert and paying attention to as much of it as we can all the time but we can fix the problems uh, in some cases if we're lucky so i'm going to get out this vulture that's waiting relatively patiently in the box here All right, so the bird we brought with us today is a vulture, just like the turkey vulture and the black vulture. It's one of our new world vultures. So remember 22 species on the planet, or 23 if you include the palm nut vulture, which is sometimes called the vulturine fish eagle. Uh, he's a lot more like a bald eagle than he is like a vulture. So most people probably wouldn't include them. If we're saying obligate scavenger, certainly wouldn't include them there. And again, obligate scavenger means only eating dead stuff. This is the smallest of the vultures found here in the New World. It's a species called the lesser yellow-headed vulture. So lesser because they have a cousin, the greater yellow-headed vulture that looks just like this, except it's a little bit larger. The yellow-headed part, I hopefully don't have to, to uh, explain to you where that um, name came from. If, if we've got any decent color on our Facebook Live video here, you can see bright yellow on the face, some red around the nape of his neck, even some blue uh, under and around his eyes. A very colorful bird uh, on the bald skin on the head. This is a close cousin of our native turkey vulture that you would find if you were in Central and South America. And if you're familiar with the turkey vulture, I think that the yellow-headed vulture will likely look familiar to you. Um, he's very much like a turkey vulture, except with a uh, yellow head instead of a red head. If we look at the underside of the wing, that trailing edge has that same silvery white appearance, the entire length of the wing from the body to the tip. Um, in flight, very similar to a turkey vulture, other than being smaller and a little darker in, in overall coloration, they are very much like their turkey vulture cousins uh, in flight. 
fortunately for us in North America, we don't have to try to uh, identify between the two because we don't have this species here. Uh, one other interesting similarity is uh, the nostril. I don't know if we can get close enough without upsetting the bird, but he has what's called a perforate nostril. Um, the opening for his, uh, his scent gland goes all the way through his skull. You can see all the way through there. We know that turkey vultures and yellow-headed vultures uh, have well-developed senses of smell. Most birds, common thought is that they probably don't have too much of a sense of smell, if any at all. But as a scavenger like this, having a well-developed sense of smell is very important. So um, this is one sort of outside piece of evidence that they have a, have a sense of smell. And we could actually test that. Um, and it has been tested actually back many, many years ago, back in the uh, early 19th century, John James Audubon looked at vultures and said, I wonder if they can smell and went out and did some some studies to see if he could prove whether they could or not. This is a bird that was actually bred here at the center as a part of our captive propagation program. So I mentioned how captive breeding and release programs in some cases can be very helpful, um, but they take time to develop. The understanding of how to breed the birds in captivity can take time to develop as well. And so uh, we look at the understanding of how to breed these birds in captivity as, as almost as important as the ability to do so in time of crisis. It's not an uncommon species in the wild. They're not declining today. But again, we wanna be as prepared as possible uh, in case something were to happen moving forward. Looks like some questions. When I see them circling in the sky around the neighborhood, does that mean there's something dead under them? So when I see them circling in the sky around my neighborhood, does that mean that there's something dead under them? Uh, it may, but generally when vultures see something dead, it's not circling and going up that they're doing, it's diving down to the ground to eat the dead thing. So uh, if you're standing in your neighborhood and you see a bunch of vultures dropping out of the sky to the ground, that's a good indication that there's something dead. But what are those ones circling up in the sky doing? Well, vultures are social. They're social scavengers, and it's one of the most powerful tools for them in terms of locating a meal. So usually when you see those vultures circling overhead, they're doing two things. Firstly, they're looking. They're being as observant as they can to uh, try to locate the, the scene of a carcass, if you will. So. Um, might not be obvious right away but what's happening behind me on the ground out here is a big scene and everybody who's in the air can see it um, that's important to them so those birds up above are looking down here to see if they can see something like a lot of birds moving on the ground the second thing that they're doing when they're circling like that is generally they are gaining altitude so there are a few vultures out doing it off uh, over to uh, my right over here but they are trapping hot air using those big broad wings to soar, to gain altitude, so that they can have a broader vantage point, so that they can see a greater distance to look for a scene like the one behind me. So usually vultures with something dead under them are dropping to the ground to feed on it. Vultures circling in the air are seeking that next meal or perhaps traveling to another location. Great question. All right, well, um, we've had fun chatting with you uh, about vultures this morning. Hopefully um, you learned a little something. Um, I mentioned a little earlier that, uh, or in the, actually in the last live feed that we did whenever, uh, start looking at those birds in your backyard. Tell us about those. Tell us about how many vultures you see. Comment about that in the, in the post there on, uh, on Facebook. A uh, few other points to, to throw out there at you. We are a nonprofit organization, and one of the reasons we're doing these is for our own souls so that we can keep doing what we love to do, which is teaching you about these animals. Um, but we also are putting ourselves out there to stay on the forefront of your thoughts during this uh, sort of crazy time. Um, we can't invite the public to our center to do these programs. We can't have schools out here, and we can't travel to schools to do our programming. And much of our budget the food that goes to pay these uh, feed these birds the, the the money that goes to keep this place running has essentially turned off uh, in the fact that we're not having those programs anymore so there are great ways for you to support us um, you can visit our website the Center for Birds of Prey .org. there's a donate now button right there we're working right now on a goal uh, to help uh, purchase our next food, uh, food supply for the next three months, which uh, we would love your support on that. The best way to do that is to go to our website. Um, also, let us know thoughts about things you'd like us to talk about in the future in terms of these programs. We've got lots of stuff planned, but um, we don't know how long we're gonna be doing this. 
in this way and, and we're just going to make the best of it um, as we move forward but if there's something you want to talk about things you're curious about things you'd like to le learn more about uh, that we can learn effectively and teach effectively about in this type of format we want to do that so communicate with us on um, comments here or send us a message or however you want to do it uh, we're keeping as close an eye on these social media tabs as we can uh, we've got a bald eagle that's above us up here we won't um, I'm not sure if it's going to come in and Jesse may be able to get some footage of it but there's an adult bald eagle bald eagles are scavengers as well uh, and so the scene of vultures on the ground has likely attracted the attention of this adult bald eagle what's probably going to happen is it's going to fly in and grab a quick uh, piece of whatever food it can and then continue on uh, you might see the bird in the image there off above very flat from left to right white on the head and the tail now the vultures can't really fly in and just grab something and go because their feet aren't built for grabbing so uh, the eagle on the other hand can size up what's happening fly in and take whatever it wants uh, and continue away and we have another visitor one of my favorite of the scavengers the the intelligence quotient the iq of the crowd just went up a little bit vultures are highly intelligent but there's one group a little smarter and that's the corvids and we just had a an American crow joined the party here, uh, a little bit smaller than the vultures out there. He's picking up and dropping some piece of food, not sure what he wants. He's going to choose what's uh, the finest of what's left out there. But you can see he's at a little bit of a disadvantage with those vultures around him. All right, well, you folks enjoy the rest of your beautiful day. Make sure to get outside. Um, I'm going to put this vulture in the box. Maybe we'll stay live for just a minute as this eagle is cruising, I think it might see us so we might move under cover a little and see if we can um, let it get to where it'll be more comfortable coming in still have eyes on it. We'll let Jesse get a comfortable spot. I don't know if you can hear those vultures when they take off. They are very noisy. I think that eagle may have spotted us and gone on the other way. So I think this is as good a time as any to say thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, keep an eye on the social media feed. Our next live feed will be happening on Wednesday at 1130. Um, Jesse and I are about to be off for a couple of days and the other half of our team, Natalie 
and Audrey will be coming on to uh, be doing the bird care for a few days and they will be bringing you a video or a live feed on uh, Wednesday that I don't think you're going to want to miss. It's going to have uh, one of our newest members of our, our family here at the center, a uh, young bird that just hatched uh, a few weeks ago that we're raising to be an educational ambassador. So you're not going to want to miss that. Tune in at 11:30. Stay tuned to our social media channels as well as to our website, the Center for Birds of Prey.org, the best place to look to find um, any of the information that we've talked about today. And don't forget to let us know what you're curious about and what bird topics we can focus on next. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you soon.